Unplugged in, President-elect Joe Biden selects his closest advisors and assembles a new national security team. Biden, a much older guy and much more a creature of traditional Washington, is going to have to be more innovative than second term Obama. Biden shows his commitment to the environment by naming a special presidential envoy for climate. In picking John Kerry was sent an incredible uh, message to the world that we are back on climate change. As the U.S. transitions from Trump to Biden, how will it change the way America engages abroad and takes care of its own? Unplugged in, Biden preparing to be president of the United States. Hello and welcome to Plugged In. I'm Greta Van Susteren reporting from Washington, D.C. U.S. President-elect Joe Biden says he is ready to lead the world and not retreat from it. Mr. Biden says as he prepares to assume office on January 20, 2021, that he is prepared to confront American adversaries and not reject its allies. As with all new administrations, his foreign policy picks have signaled a shift from the previous four years. Biden is pressing ahead with the transition process, even though President Donald Trump has yet to formally concede. VOA senior White House correspondent Patsy Widakuswara reports. President-elect Joe Biden announced key members of his foreign policy and national security team. It's a team that reflects the fact that America is back, ready to lead the world, not retreat from it once again sit at the head of the table. If confirmed by the Senate, two former State Department officials who served in the former Obama administration will hold top diplomatic posts. Anthony Blinken, former Deputy Secretary of State, is Biden's choice to lead the State Department. Linda Thomas-Greenfield, former Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, is set to become the next U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations. America is back. Multilateralism is back. Diplomacy is back. Biden's belief in historic alliances and multilateralism signals a departure from President Donald Trump's America First doctrine. He wants to restore the type of faith uh, that Americans and leaders around the world formerly had uh, in the U.S. government, but that he perceives uh, the Trump administration has really crumbled over the years. And so that message is important to world leaders who, many of whom, outside of dictators and despots, have really had a challenging time working with the incumbent administration. Biden's nominees also show an emphasis on diversity. If confirmed, Avril Haines would be the first woman to lead the intelligence community, Janet Yellen the country's first female Treasury Secretary, and Alejandro Mayorkas the first Latino to lead the Department of Homeland Security. 43-year-old Jake Sullivan would be one of the youngest national security advisors. Former Secretary of State John Kerry, who negotiated the Paris Climate Accord, will spearhead Biden's efforts to fight climate change. Another break from Trump, who has called global warming a hoax and withdrew the U.S. from the climate pact, which Biden plans to rejoin on day one. I don't for a minute underestimate the difficulties of meeting my bold commitments to fighting climate change. But at the same time, no one should underestimate for a minute my determination to do just that. Patsy Widakuswara, VOA News. The foreign policy challenges that will face the Biden administration are vast. The recent killing of one of Iran's top nuclear scientists has escalated U.S. tensions with Iran that were already escalated. Michael O'Hanlon is a senior fellow and director of foreign policy research at the Brookings Institution in Washington. We discuss some of the most pressing foreign policy issues facing the incoming president. And let me start first with Iran. We're going to be having a new president, a President Biden. How is that going to change the relationship between the United States and Iran, if it does? Well, this is gonna be one of the huge areas of change because we know the Trump administration withdrew from the 2015 nuclear deal and had something tantamount to a regime change policy towards Iran, extremely hard line, was not really joined by most of the rest of the world in that policy. And it's not clear where that policy could realistically have led, but it did apply a lot of additional pressure on Iran. And then you throw COVID on top of that, Iran is hurting. So I think Biden's got a more difficult job ahead than simply returning to the deal. That's gonna be what Iran expects and demands at first. But Iran may not really have the luxury of holding to that hard line, given the 
state of its economy. And so Biden may be looking for some kind of an interim arrangement, which uh, lifts some economic pressure and sanctions on Iran, but also refuses to lift them all until there is a longer lasting deal or a broader deal that would engender some Republican support in the United States as well. It's going to be quite a challenge. And for a team that uh, is so vested in this deal, because basically everybody on the senior uh, Biden team was part of the Obama team that negotiated the 2015 Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, they're going to have to be a little bit intellectually flexible to figure out a new path forward rather than just returning to their own baby in the form of the 2015 deal. Will, Biden, will Vice President Biden, soon to be President Biden, be different towards China than President Trump? On China, I think anybody would be different because it's such a work in progress. Even a second term Trump would have been different from a first term Trump. Even within the first term of Trump, uh, he went from trying to buddy up with Xi Jinping in the first year to then engaging in a protracted trade war, but then sometimes trying to back off that trade war. And yes, some of that was the peculiarity of Donald Trump, but it also reflected the changing view of China in the United States in economic as well as security circles. Because of course, as you know well, Greta, uh, China was an extraordinarily complex and adversarial country up until the Nixon-Kissinger opening in the early 70s. We had a very bad relationship with China for the first uh, 20 years after it went communist. But then since the Nixon-Kissinger opening, we've had basically 40 years in a row under Democrats and Republicans of trying to get along pretty well with China. And despite the occasional setback over something like Tiananmen Square, the overall path was positive and cordial. And engagement was the basic strategy that Washington followed. That doesn't exist anymore. That consensus went away even as the Biden, excuse me, the Obama presidency was ending. And so therefore, I think we are in a new era of our relations with what's become the other great superpower uh, on the planet. I would already give China that designation myself. And so I, I think we're going to have a complex relationship we haven't yet sorted out. For eight years, uh, Vice President Biden was vice president to President Obama. Now he's at four years off. Now we're going to have a President Biden. How is he going to differ from his former boss in terms of foreign policy, President Obama? Is he going to be a, a lot like him or is he going to be different? Is he going to be his own man? You know, that's just a fascinating question uh, because, you know, he should try to be his own man, clearly, even if he keeps some of the Obama philosophy. But you could argue, and many, certainly many people have argued, that Obama himself was sort of running out of gas in his foreign policy by the end of his second term. That in his first term, he had this team of rivals, Bob Gates, Hillary Clinton. He was projecting big visions and ideas for the world. And in the second term, he was sort of just trying to minimize America's, you know, burdens and uh, losses in places like Afghanistan. He had to deal with the rise of ISIS. He had to deal with the return of Russia and the growing strength of China. And he didn't quite seem to adopt policies that were up to most of these challenges very quickly. Now, over time, to be fair to Obama, um, the Iraq strategy that he adopted against ISIS did work out under President Trump, largely a continuous policy. It just took time to make it work. Also, I think Obama deserves some credit for being patient and restrained in his reactions to the Russian aggression against Ukraine which we had no alliance obligation to try to prevent and could have led to war. And I also give Obama credit for not getting us into yet another Middle Eastern or other conflict on a large scale. But the overall perception of Obama was sort of running out of gas, running out of steam, running out of energy, and America pulling back. Even some of Obama's own former officials, like Bali Nasser, wrote books that were critical of how Obama was was handling this new set of threats. So ironically, for such a visionary president and such a smart guy, he didn't seem quite ready for all the new challenges. So in that regard, Biden, a much older guy and much more a creature of traditional Washington, is going to have to be more innovative than second term Obama. How do you reconcile Trump's sort of America first uh, foreign policy and President uh, a President Biden, at least, it seems to me, is thinking of the, the U.S. engaging more in the world. 
Well, I think that, you know, it's, it's better for Biden not to pick every single fight he could imagine with outgoing President Trump. And America First might have been a slogan that carried Thank some uh, overtones Thank that, you know, everybody. not all of us liked on the it's Democratic like side or on the Dow Biden Jones team. I'm not on the Biden team, but I'm just saying multilateralists, you know, many of us who are sort of traditional foreign policy people um, and Biden people did not really like some of the connotation that went along with America First. However, the basic phrase and idea of America First is sort of unobjectionable when you think about it, because every president of the United States puts America first. And if he doesn't, you have to ask why he wanted to be president of the United States. Every leader of every country puts their own country first. The question is, how do you do it? Do you do you ignore the interests and the concerns of your allies and other countries along the way? And um, so Biden doesn't have to say that America first was a bad idea. He just says that he wants to put him. He should say he wants to put America first while he also puts the interests of allies and other countries on a high elevated level and uh, discusses through dialogue as much as possible what the concerns are of other countries before making decisions that are designed to serve American interests first and foremost. That's the kind of language that I would advise Biden to use. But I'll be fascinated to see if he wants to do something like that or if he wants to just completely reject the Trump slogan and Trump thinking. That's going to be one of his big decisions for his inaugural speech and beyond. Michael, thank you very much. Always nice to talk to you. Brad, thanks for having me on. President-elect Biden has announced Antony Blinken as his nominee for Secretary of State. A proponent of international alliances, Mr. Blinken previously held top foreign policy positions in both the Clinton and Obama presidential administrations. VOA's Cindy Sane has a closer look at Biden's choice to be the country's next top diplomat. Iran made a fundamental choice. Antony Blinken served as Deputy Secretary of State during the former Obama-Biden administration and has been advising President-elect Joe Biden since 2002. He graduated from high school in Paris, France, and is a strong supporter of NATO and other alliances and multilateral institutions. Blinken led the U.S. response to a global refugee crisis and in 2016, he appeared on the American children's show Sesame Street to explain who refugees are and how we can all learn from each other. These are people who've had to leave their homes because life in their countries was not safe for them. Grover, can you imagine how difficult it would be to have to leave your home? No, I cannot. I would never want to leave Sesame Street. Some analysts say Blinken's first priority will be to repair relationships and rejoin agreements President Donald Trump quit, like the Iran nuclear deal and others. I think his first and most major priority will be uh, restoring the perception of the United States as a trusted ally and partner around the world. Uh, I think he's going to want to shore up relationships that were damaged. Essentially, you know, the mantra is we're back. Um, you know, re-enter the United States uh, into the climate, the Paris Climate Accords, um, you know, trying to find a way potentially to extend the New START agreement. In another announcement, veteran diplomat Linda Thomas-Greenfield is Biden's choice to be the next U.S. ambassador to the United Nations. But what I did have, I had the hopes and the dreams of my mother, who taught me at a very early age that I could face any challenge or adversity put in my path. If confirmed by the Senate, Blinken would assume State Department leadership from Mike Pompeo, who has served as Secretary of State since April 2018. Cindy Sane, VOA News, Washington. President-elect Joe Biden has said he will not immediately cancel the U.S.-China trade deal negotiated by President Trump earlier this year, nor will he take any immediate steps to remove tariffs on Chinese exports. Meanwhile, U.S. farmers are paying close attention to Biden's cabinet selections for their impact on trade policy with China. VOA's Kane Farabaugh reports from Bloomington, Illinois. After a tumultuous four years marked by trade uncertainty and now a global pandemic, many farmers across the country still supported President Donald Trump. Despite ongoing and unsupported claims of voter fraud, 
They are coming to terms with his loss in the November election. It appears that the president's chances grow dimmer day by day. I certainly think that uh, you could see instances of fraud and, and uh, manipulation, but I, I find it hard to see that there would be uh, that on the, the scale uh, that would be needed to turn it around. Yeah, I think it's done. Fred Greeter and Brian Duncan both farm crops in the Midwestern state of Illinois, where President-elect Joe Biden won a decisive victory fueled by support in densely populated areas like Chicago. But rural Illinois, where President Trump was popular, is important to the nation's agriculture industry. Although about 1% of the U.S. population lives on a farm, the agriculture and food industry represents about 5% of U.S. gross domestic product. Illinois is one of the country's leading exporters of corn and soybeans, crops both Greeter and Duncan raise on their farms, which is why they are interested in whom Biden picks to lead the United States Department of Agriculture or USDA. I'd rather see someone who's more production ag oriented uh, to fill that role, who can understand the needs of rural America and the farmers, um, because really USDA is, is the, one, the one advocate we have in administration. That's the person that has to go to the president uh, and make sure that they advocate for what agriculture's needs are. So that's going to be a key one. But the other one I think is the uh, USTR position and whoever that trade representative is will be a very, very key person for us. Closely followed by that uh, would probably be who the director of the EPA is. Mark Gebhardt is the Illinois Farm Bureau's Director of Governmental Affairs. He works with government agencies on behalf of Illinois farmers to guide public policy, which includes environmental regulations and trade issues. But there's a lot of unknowns, especially when it comes to China. And as you know, China is the big player in the game uh, when it comes to the dollars and the purchases they make. Under President Trump, tens of billions of dollars in government aid flowed to farmers to offset losses and profit, resulting from the administration's escalating trade disputes, mostly with China. Despite recent progress, China hasn't reached pre-trade war levels of purchases on products such as soybeans. But they're still purchasing more from the competitors of the United States than they are from the U.S. University of Chicago political science professor Robert Galati says the benefits of the Trump administration's trade policies may not be realized until well after Trump has left office. Yeah, Biden is in a better position when it comes to trade policy in some sense and in a negotiation sense because of the actions that the Trump administration has taken. At the same time, though, it's been quite disruptive. Farmer Brian Duncan is taking a wait-and-see approach as he prepares for farm life under a new presidential administration. Kane Fairbaugh, VOA News, Bloomington, Illinois. Environmentalists are praising President-elect Biden's decision to appoint former Secretary of State John Kerry as the first-ever climate envoy for national security. Kerry helped negotiate the 2015 Paris Climate Agreement adopted by nearly 200 countries. Late last year, President Trump, a vocal critic of the agreement, withdrew the United States from the deal. Carol Browner was the administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency under President Bill Clinton. She also served as director of the White House Office of Energy and Climate Change Policy under President Obama. We spoke about the future of U.S. climate policy and what it means for the world. Joe has sort of taken the climate issue, and, and, and it is so huge. It is not just a domestic issue, as your, your audience knows. It's a global issue. And he said, I'm going to have John Kerry lead the global side of this issue. I need someone to be out there working with other countries, uh, working in all of the various global forms where we can advance uh, the agenda to reduce uh, dangerous uh, carbon pollution. And so, you know, John, having been Secretary of State John Kerry, will be quite successful at that. Uh, the world knows John Kerry. The world leaders know John Kerry. And what the, uh, President-elect Biden did in picking John Kerry was sent an incredible uh, message to the world that we are back on climate change. Not only am I going to re-up uh, the U.S. into the Paris Accord, I am going to put a person that you all know that is quite committed on these issues. What is, what's the value of the Paris Accord? Well, what the Paris Accord was all about was each country making a commitment, a plan of what they would do to achieve reductions and then working you know, together and holding each other accountable. Signing back up says the United States is prepared to put in place programs that achieve measurable, sustainable pollution, climate pollution uh, reductions. Uh, we can do this. This is not impossible for the United States. Um, in part because of what President Obama did, in part because what the private sector has done in the last four years while President Trump has turned away from climate change, and in part because what states have done. You have more than 
two dozen states now that have clean energy standards that will mean reductions in carbon pollution. And so when we look at all of those activities, plus what President-elect Biden is committing to, we can meet our targets. We can be an important part of helping to lead the world. You know, Greta, it's so important for your, your listeners to just remember climate change, unlike a lot of other pollutants, is a global phenomenon. It does matter where the, the pollution comes from, and you need to address the immediate impact, and whether that's asthma or respiratory illnesses. But once it's up in the climate, it becomes a sort of a global problem. So all of us doing our part is very important. And the United States, back at the table in a thoughtful way with its domestic agenda, will make a huge difference. How, how do you answer the question, uh, is that the, if you have a lesser developed country, look at the United States, and the United States now, you know, you know, with all with the new rules and regulations of hoping to improve the environment, where they say, well, sure, you've already ruined the environment, have done all these things, we want to develop now, and if we have to comply with some of these uh, agreements, is that it inhibits our economic ability to move forward. Uh, that's a fair. That's a fair question. It's a fair uh, discussion. It's one that happens in these international forums. What Paris is about is each country to the best of their ability. So it recognizes that countries aren't identical and that countries' histories are different. Even internally, domestically, how do you make a decision uh, when it's environment versus the economy? What sort of you know, what's the well? I don't think you have to make that decision. And in fact, I would suggest that a cleaner uh, environment gets you a better economy, and a better economy allows you to invest in a, a cleaner economy. Is it too late? Uh, you know what? I'm an optimist. I'm not a pessimist. I don't believe it's too late. It is more challenging because we have waited too, so long, but it is not too late. I have absolute confidence in American leadership, American innovation, and American ingenuity. And if we set the targets, I have no doubt that we will find the solutions, and we will find them faster and more cheaply. And that is a good COVID example, what just happened on all of the vaccine work, right? We People put their minds to it. And, and hopefully we're going to see, I guess, maybe before the end of the year, the first vaccines. We can do the same thing on climate change. Thank you very much for joining me. Thank you. After four years of President Trump's America First policy, President-elect Joe Biden says his administration will reassert America's historic role as a global leader. VOA's United Nations correspondent, Margaret Bashir reports on the expectations that the United States will re-engage at the world body. When he introduced his top national security and foreign policy officials last month, President-elect Joe Biden said they reflect that America is back. Ready to lead the world, not retreat from it. Once again, sit at the head of the table. Ready to confront our adversaries, and not reject our allies, ready to stand up for our values. At the United Nations, the Trump administration has slashed hundreds of millions of dollars in funding to programs, including peacekeeping missions, Palestinian refugees, and for women's reproductive health. It pulled out of UN agencies like the World Health Organization and quit a major accord on climate action. Biden could win some international goodwill by quickly undoing some of Trump's policies. Experts say U.N. Secretary General Antonio Guterres will likely have more latitude with the new U.S. administration. I think we're going to see Guterres laying out some pretty ambitious plans in the year ahead on how to fight climate change and how to fight inequality, because in a sense he's, he's liberated to promote uh, ambitious ideas for international cooperation after a period in which he had to be enormously cautious to avoid offending Trump. Biden's nominee to be U.N. ambassador and member of his cabinet is career diplomat Linda Thomas-Greenfield. America is back. Multilateralism is back. Diplomacy is back. Diplomats have publicly and privately welcomed her nomination. Uh, we think um, uh, that she would bring to bear her vast um, experience, over three decades of diplomacy. And that's when we need it now. Now we need... Um, uh, uh, a diplomatic skills, maturity, and knowing that we have a common cause, all of us. Whether to rejoin the Iran nuclear deal will quickly test the new administration. Uh, the president-elect recognizes that this is going to be a tough road ahead. If Iran were to uh, enter into strict compliance with the 2015 deal, then the U.S. will rejoin the deal, uh, but 
only as the beginning of follow-on negotiations, and that's where the difficulties are going to come. At the United Nations, China moved to expand its influence as the Trump administration pulled back. Biden, I think, will want to limit Chinese influence, but does know that in some ways it's necessary to work with Beijing. Both allies and adversaries are eager to see how Biden and his UN envoy will translate this new U.S. leadership at the United Nations. Margaret Bashir, VOA News, New York. The economic slowdown caused by the pandemic has been devastating to many small businesses and low-income workers here in the U.S. Those frontline workers, many of whom are women and people of color, hope the new president will mean a rise in the federal minimum wage. VOA reporter Veronica Balderas Iglesias looks at the pros and cons for the incoming Biden administration. Orlando Davila has worked in this microbusiness since 2012. The 73-year-old Bolivian-born prep cook really should retire, but he can't afford that. I need to work because I have a house and need to pay $3,000 in mortgage plus water, electricity and gas. 75% of workers at this Virginia restaurant earn between $8 and $12 an hour. That's a little bit higher than the federal minimum wage, which now stands at $7.25 an hour. President-elect Joe Biden has promised to double that minimum wage to $15 an hour. The restaurant's creative director, Chloe Swanson, wants to support her workers. She knows the cost of living has gone up over the years. But she agrees with President Donald Trump and Senate Republicans, who say boosting wages puts businesses under stress. Because you realize that you have to have some major budgetary cuts, perhaps even just staffing cuts. I do believe we are overdue for a minimum wage raise. I think it's something that should be done incrementally. A bill to do just that is stalled in Congress, thanks mainly to differences between Republicans and Democrats. It would gradually hike the pay floor to $15 an hour by 2025. In the meantime, seven states already have or are moving towards a $15 minimum. Add to that Florida, where voters approved it in this month's election. We're worth more. Raising the wage is a matter of fairness, said Ben Zipper, an economist at the Economic Policy Institute. Women, uh, people of color, are disproportionately paid low wages. We actually have, unfortunately, um, you know, a racist and sexist labor market in the United States. And we should use whatever policy tools that we um, have in order to correct that problem. But not everyone agrees. Adnan Hamidi, owner of a cupcake shop, calls it government interference. Investment programs that are able to help them. How about grow the person versus mandating someone to, to deplete a payroll, basically? The Congressional Budget Office estimates that raising the federal minimum wage by 2025 could boost wages for some 27 million workers, but also cost 1.3 million jobs. Whether Biden can break the stalemate in Congress may hinge on a critical January election in the state of Georgia. Two U.S. Senate seats are on the ballot. The outcome will decide whether Democrats can win control of the Senate in addition to the House. There are smaller things that can be done through uh, presidential actions or executive orders, but an economy-wide change in labor law requires uh, congressional approval. Low-wage workers like Natalie Pogmeyer, a beauty salon tech, are hopeful. It shouldn't be such a struggle to be at the bottom of the ladder. And I think you're going to have a stronger team and a team that stays longer if you're paying them a fair wage. Veronica Valderas Iglesias for VOA News, Virginia. That's all the time we have for now. Thank you to my guests, Brookings Institution Senior Fellow Michael O'Hanlon and former EPA Administrator Carol Browner. Stay up to date with the latest news at our website, voanews.com, and follow me on Twitter, at Greta. And thank you for being plugged in.